BalancedPayoff.com is a paying sponsor of this Fresh Hell podcast. You've tried balance transfers and budgeting, but high interest rates and unrelenting bill cycles make it almost impossible to get out of credit card debt on your own. Instead of another new savings technique, you need a clear path out of debt. And that's what a payoff loan can do. A payoff loan is a personal loan backed by member-centric credit unions designed to help you pay off your credit cards with rates as low as 5.99% APR and loan amounts up to $35,000 with no hidden fees and personal customer service support from payoff to help you reach your financial goals. Some of the benefits of a payoff loan may also include potential credit score boost, one monthly payment, and savings from lower interest rates. Go to payoff.com slash fresh podcast to learn more. Checking loan rates won't affect your credit score. Try something new. Pay off your credit card debt with payoff. NMLS ID number 1396805. Not all applicants may qualify. Loans only available within the United States. Loan is not available in all states. Payoff works with lending partners who originate the loans. Additional terms, conditions, and eligibility requirements may apply. More information is available at payoff dot com slash fresh hell podcast. You're listening to the Fresh Hell Podcast. Fresh Hell contains stories of a disturbing and often graphic nature and is intended for a mature audience. Please don't let your kids listen to this or they might turn out like us. Hi, and welcome to The Freshest Tell. I'm Johanna from Vienna, Austria. And I'm Annie from just outside Boston, Massachusetts. Before we start, we would like to give a huge shout out to each and everyone who sent us a message in the last couple of weeks. We try to respond to all of them. If we haven't yet, we are very sorry, but we want you to know that we do read each and every one of the emails and messages that you send. The best way to reach us is either via email at freshhellpodcast at gmail.com, or even better, you can direct message us in Facebook or on Instagram. So, Johanna, what do you have for us today? Today I want to tell you about yet another female Austrian murderer. Researching for this podcast taught me one thing. I mean, it taught me many things, (laughs) but one of the things I learned was that Austria has a whole bunch of interesting female murderers. (laughs) Who would have known? So we already talked about Eva Faschonerin and about Marta Marek, and the mantis Elfriede Blaunsteiner is another one on my list of cases to cover. Hi, Lucien. Yes, I promise I'm on it. (laughs) She always bugs me about it that we should do that case. But this week, I would love to talk about a case from 1808, the murder of Matthias Kandl. Oh, all right. I don't know this one at all. Are there any warnings for our listeners? Yes. So I will be mentioning domestic violence and possible spousal rape. So if this is a trigger for you, you should skip this episode. Also, we always tell you this when it comes to these old timey cases. It's often difficult to separate law from facts. If I got anything wrong, please don't hesitate to contact us and let us know. So, all right, let's get started. Okay. As I said... This takes place in 1808, and once more we travel to Vienna. (laughs) Beautiful, rude Vienna, with lots of house porn, lots of food porn, and lots of word porn, if you are in very unique insults and curse words, that is. Yeah, you know I am. (laughs) (laughs) But how was life in Vienna at the beginning of the 19th century? Well, let me paint a picture for you. Oh, please do. So we are right in between the two times Austria was at war with... Napoleon. The first time was in 1805, when the French troops entered the city on 13th of November. Three French officers had simply walked across the Tabor Bridge in the second district. I lived in that area, it's amazing. And they told the Austrian officer in command that the war is practically over and they should just hand over the city. (laughs) Which they did. And when the French troops entered the city, the Viennese people flocked to the streets to look at the procession, more out of curiosity than out of fear. The next day, Emperor Napoleon I himself stepped through the gates of Schönbrunn Palace and he spent a couple of lovely days there before heading over to Austerlitz. And after his victory in Austerlitz, he once more returned to Vienna, stayed again in Schönbrunn from 12th of December until 27th of December. I don't know why, as it is our summer castle, but whatever, I mean, it's lovely. And they signed the Treaty of Pressbaum, a treaty of friendship with the Austrian Emperor Franz II or Franz I, depending on what you're referring to. Uh, second or first, how come? 
Okay, uh, he was ruling the Austrian Empire as Franz I, but he was also the ruler of the Holy Roman Empire, and this he did under the name Franz II. Mm. So he was the last ruler, as the Holy Roman Empire was dissolved in 1806. Okay. We're not going to judge, because I think we both are still working on having our correct married names on legal <laughs> documents. And it's been, True. <laughs> like, will I complete it before our 10th anniversary? Who can say? <laughs> Okay, so the first Austro-French war didn't end all that bad. I'm not saying that this war wasn't bad. It just didn't hit the Viennese as hard as the second time. Yeah. Because the second one in 1809 was a whole different thing, because that time the French had to use heavy artillery, and this time Napoleon stayed more than five months in Schönbrunn, ruling his empire from the Austrian capital, even celebrating his 40th birthday there, which was a huge humiliation to Franz I and the whole Habsburg Empire. Don't worry, though. Even hating Napoleon didn't hinder Franz I to marry his daughter Marie-Louise to the French parvenu, or the Antichrist, as <laughs> she called him. Marie-Louise was said to even have um, a kind of Napoleon voodoo doll that she used as a device for her anger management. Okay, but who doesn't, though? Am I right? All right, so that's enough talk about Napoleon and the French wars. How do we always get Napoleon in here? I don't know. It's because you love him. That's because our cases are from that time period. What can I do? It's true. It's true. But what else was going on in Vienna at the time? So what was then the city of Vienna included roughly 6,600 houses and had around 230,000 people living there. If we take a look at London, which we also covered in quite a few cases, uh, during the first real census in 1801, they counted 1.1 million people. I think we talked a lot already about life in London slums, so life in Vienna was hard and grim but by far not as grim as in many other metropolitan areas. Don't worry, though, the industrialization would hit Vienna too, and by the beginning of the 20th century, there would be over 2 million people living in the Austrian capital, many not even owning their own bed to sleep in, so people had to sleep in shifts. 2 million people. That's more than today, as we're now at, I think, 1.8 million. But nowadays, Vienna includes a way larger area. Yeah, it's too many people. <laughs> it's too many people. Yeah. But in 1808, Beethoven was living and composing in the city, so is Josef Haydn. He would die the next year, in 1809. Uh, and also Antonio Salieri. I guess you all know him as the nemesis of Amadeus in the movie <laughs> Amadeus and their theater play. Uh, Franz Schubert was still a teenage boy, just starting out to sing as a Wiener Sängerknabe, and Mozart had been dead for 17 years by now. Which is a weird thing to see. Can you imagine living in a time when Mozart is only dead for 17 years? Yeah, that seems... Um, that would be pretty amazing. Just like yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it does seem like yesterday. It really does. But he was still alive in 1785, and that's when Theresia Kandel was born. Uh, I couldn't find a whole lot about her family or her early life, and by not a whole lot, I mean practically nothing... Mm. I have one source that calls her the daughter of a judge. I'm not sure how accurate that is. I have read in another source that she spent her teenage years in a convent. That might be true. I know that she had at least one brother, and she was born and raised in Atzgersdorf. Now, Atzgersdorf nowadays is part of the 23rd district and lies in the southwest of Vienna. But back in the early 19th century, it was mostly farmland and fields. Theresia grew up and she was considered to be a remarkable beauty. She was described as having blue eyes, a pale face uh, with uh, very symmetric features, long blonde hair, and it looks as if she was rather slim and small. And I'm just mentioning this because it's of some interest later on in this story. Okay. So you could say that she was a very pretty young woman and she caught the eye of several men. One of them was a butcher's son named Michael or Michel Pellmann. And we can all imagine where this story goes. Oh, did she get pregnant? Of course. Yeah. Theresia and Michael had started a romance and Theresia was pregnant. And unfortunately, Theresia's family did not approve of Michael Pellmann. His father's business was not bringing in enough money, Pellmann Senior was in debt, and therefore his son was not wanted as a son-in-law. The child, a girl, was born and placed in an orphanage almost immediately, and according to sources, the girl died only one month later. Oh, that was, unfortunately, that was common enough for infants at that time under the best of circumstances, but yeah, yeah that's still sad. But of course now, Theresa's good name was ruined, and the family was desperately looking for a way to salvage their daughter's quote-unquote honor. Oh. Honor has always been a curious thing to me. 
So I personally think what is honorable is to act like a decent person, you know, not to harm others, trying to be mindful, trying to be helpful. So it is a thing that comes from your positive actions. Yet to this day, many people still believe that honor is something that can be taken from you by others mostly by some form of unwanted interaction with female relatives. Someone makes a gross remark about your mom, he took away your honor. Someone looked at your wife in the wrong way, he took away your honor. But it also works the other way. Your little sister or your daughter had sex with a man, she took away your honor. Mm -hmm. It's indeed a very strange and fragile thing, honor. Right. It just it feels like it's always the men with no honor to lose who complain the loudest about losing their honor, right? Yeah. They're already ugh. We could honestly probably do an entire podcast just on honor murders. In this case, it definitely sounds a lot more like the pathetic patriarchy and not, you know, a deep-rooted cultural thing. To be fair, it's men as much as women who complain about someone's honor. Right. Always gonna remember my grandmother, how horrible it was to her that I was wearing a miniskirt in the little town where she was living, because what the neighbor's gonna say, you know. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. My great aunt, <laughs> which I think I've told you before, the nun, everything yeah. I wore was inappropriate. And yeah. even with my parents, you know, you're not leaving the house in that mm. uh, regularly. And it's funny because, you know, I would say to them as an adult, you know, is kind of ridiculous that you would ever say that. And they'll say, well, at the time, we were just doing the best we could to try yeah. to keep you safe, you know, which I 100% get. I'm glad the conversation is changing. Exactly, yeah. Very yeah. true. So, Teresa had brought shame onto her family with her sinful ways, and this needed to be fixed. And then a white knight called Matthias Kandel in shining armor came galloping on his noble steed, and he swiped Theresia off her feet onto his horse, and he rode off into the sunset and lived happily ever after. Oh really? She was she was kidnapped by a handsome stranger <laughs> and it just worked out great. I'm I'm going to say I bet not. <laughs> You're absolutely right. No, there was no white knight. No swooping, no sunset, definitely no happily ever after. There was, however, a man named Matthias Kandel, the owner of a little variety store in Matzlensdorf. Matzlensdorf nowadays is part of the 5th district and lies south of the city center. The much older and rather well-off Matthias Kandel was willing to marry Theresia and the family hoped this would silence all the talk about Theresia being a woman of loose morals. So they got married and Matthias brought his new bride to live with him in Matzlensdorf. Their home and their shop that was apparently called zum Salzküffel, so something something with salt, had oh. the address Hungelgrund 9. Hungelgrund 9. Uh, of course, in the last 200 years, a lot of street names changed and so did the Hungelgrund. It simply doesn't exist anymore in that form. But I really wanted to know where it once was, so I checked and tried to figure it out. Alas, it was all in vain. I have no idea where the Hungelgrund exactly was. I just know that there is an area called Hungelbrunn, so I assume that the Hungelgrund must have been somewhere in that area between Matzlensdorfer Platz and Südtiroler Platz. I know that's <laughs> yet again a whole lot of German names, I'm sorry. <laughs> No, I love it. I like the way you say it. <laughs> I bet I'm not alone. I bet a lot of people really enjoyed listening to you. Okay, if some Viennese history expert is listening right now and knows where the Hungelgrund was located and what it is called nowadays, please send us a message. I would highly appreciate it. Thank you. Now, if you think that Theresia had a peaceful and harmonic life from now on, you are truly mistaken. Matthias was a drunk, and he regularly beat his wife, and according to some sources, he even raped her. Which, let's just talk real truth here for a moment, is very doubtful. You want to know why? Because rape in a marriage didn't exist. You couldn't rape your wife. Because you could take her whenever you felt like it. She had no right to say no. And if you took her by force, you were absolutely in your right to do so. Does that mean that every husband back then forced himself onto his wife? Of course not. I'm sure that the majority of men were just as loving and as caring as they are today. But I can guarantee you that nobody would have considered Matthias Kandel a rapist if he would have forced Theresia to have sex with him. Do you want to know when it became a crime to rape your wife in Austria? 1989. 1989. This is beyond words. And I even remember the discussion back then because yes, there was a discussion. I was already 10 years old. Why am I even shocked? I mean... There are still people who believe one cannot be raped by a date, let alone by a life partner. Oh, sure. There are plenty of people here who believe that you can't be raped by a spouse, and um, it's deplorable. So what I wanted to say is not that I don't think that Matthias raped Theresia or that he did. I just wanted to highlight that 
If he did, it would not have been considered rape for another 180 years. Mm -hmm. People wonder why women get, like, agitated by things. This kind of shit is why. I think, looking at all sources, it seems that all agree on Matthias Kandel was cruel to his young wife, and one night in December of 1808, she just couldn't take it anymore. Or, as Theresia later was quoted, Auskreuten hobbies nimmer. And what does that mean? It's Viennese slang for I just couldn't take it any longer. Okay, fair enough. It's literally what you had just said it was, yeah. Sorry. It was the 19th of December, 1808, and Matthias once more came home drunk verbally abused the 23-year-old Theresia, threatened to beat her up, and then went to bed. It must have been then, looking at her snoring husband, that Theresia thought to herself, enough is enough. So she went down to the basement, picked up the axe, brought it back up with her to the bedroom, then she lifted the tool above her husband and struck him at least 10 times. Fresh hell, all the axes, all the time. All the time. (laughs) They were just so... Always so readily available. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that reminds me, I have one more thing I ordered for us when I was super high a couple weeks ago, (laughs) and it arrived over the weekend, so I'm going to be putting it in your, um, I guess it's a very thoughtfully curated Christmas slash birthday slash new house gift box (laughs) with a definite axe theme to it, so filling out the customs forms is going to be great. Like, a number of tiny axes... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, I, it's, I don't know how that's going to go at all. But, oh boy. Okay, so she's hit a breaking point and she has now struck her husband 10 times with an axe. Uh-huh. So that's classic, sounds like desperation overkill. Uh-huh. And uh, And then what happens? So then the horrible reality of what she had just done hit her and she panicked. She had just murdered her husband. She had to get rid of the body, but where? How? Well, I'm going to guess, because she's just killed him with an axe. Did she go ahead and dismember him? No, not at all. Actually, what she did was she got a butte. Um, a butte? A what? A butte? (laughs) Yes, a butte. Okay. So you remember back in our Krampus episode, I told you that he takes away the naughty children and carries them off? Yes, I remember. He puts them in a wicker basket that he carries on his back. Exactly. Now... Most of the times he doesn't have a wicker basket. Traditionally, he's pictured with something that resembles a barrel or a vat made of wood. And this is called a bütte. It often has a lid or something to cover it, like some kind of fabric. And it has two straps made of leather most of the time so that you can carry the bütte like a backpack. Oh, okay. Well, that sounds heavy and uncomfortable. I'm sure they can be very heavy. So Theresia gets this contraption and somehow manages to put her husband, who weighs 100 kilo or 220 pounds, into the vet. No. Yes. That weight of 220 pounds. I honestly, I don't know how she did it. Oh, my friend Misty. Hi, Misty. I don't know if she listens. She and my sister would make a joke about hearty European stock there. (laughs) Yeah, those two can deadlift more than I would have thought. But this is amazing. This is, um, wow, that's a lot. But that's not all, because then she somehow manages to place the two straps on her shoulders and lift the bütte with her husband's body inside. But she not only lifts it onto her back, she then carries Matthias through the cold and dark December night. And here is one of the lores that might be fact or might not, who knows. While she was carrying her burden through the nightly streets, she of course struggled a lot and one of her straps started to slip off her shoulder. And while she desperately tried to regain her balance and put the strap back on, a police officer came across her. He saw the young pretty woman she was in need and so he stopped to help her readjust her shoulder straps. Then he wished her a good night and continued his walk. Who knows if this really happened? I have no idea. Oh, I bet it did happen. I think it happened. It makes for a good story, though. It really does. Yeah. Then she walked down the southern part of the Ziegelofengasse in the 4th district, which was back then called Piaristengasse. Okay, here comes an important part that might sound a little bit confusing. Let me explain. Nowadays, there is a Piaristengasse in the 8th district. Back then, the nowadays Piaristengasse was called Klostergasse. You shouldn't confuse those two. I mean, who amongst us ever would make that mistake? (laughs) Not me. (laughs) I just want to make this clear because it is kind of important to the lore and also for our occasional Viennese listeners. No, I I absolutely understand where you're coming from. I get it. Hi, Vienna. So 
There seems to be some confusion that she did take him to the Nawatis Pieristengasse, which would mean she would have schlepped him halfway across town. And that's one of the lores, that Theresia Kandel carried her super heavy husband halfway across Vienna. Wow. But she was not carrying him that far, if I understand the sources correctly. The nowadays Pieristengasse was still called Klostergasse in 1808 and was only renamed Pieristengasse in 1810. Oh. Don't get me wrong, that's still a 1 to 2 kilometer walk, so 0.6 to 1.2 miles. And it's still pretty impressive with your dead husband on your back, if you ask me. But it's not that far. You're not walking across half the country. It's yeah, manageable exactly. with resting. Yeah. So she was walking down the Ziegelhofengasse when she just couldn't anymore. And so she put the Bütte on the ground, pulled the body out of the Bütte and left him right there and then. Uh, fun fact. The Austrian singer-songwriter Falco grew up in the Ziegelhofengasse. I assume you all know Rock Me Amadeus. Oh, yeah, of course. If any of our listeners don't know it, we have a Fresh Hell playlist on Spotify that started as a birthday playlist for Johanna. It's now 15 hours long and contains everything <laughs> from sea shanties to death metal, including, <laughs> after we record this, Rock Me Amadeus. So, yeah. I love that playlist. It's really random, but so are we. <laughs> True. I think this is a great place to pause for a quick word by our sponsor, Best fiends. The end of the school year is fast approaching. Are you at home practicing social distancing with your kids while also trying to work remotely and you're running out of ideas how to safely occupy them? Maybe it's time for them to meet some new fiends, like Lapoleon the Cockroach, Rose the Orchid Mantis, and interestingly, Bo, who is a dragon slug. Bo is a very fancy slug and out to get all the mean, boring slugs. Who doesn't love a fancy slug? And of course, your kids are surely going to love one of my favorites, Pop the Axolotl. Yeah, and you can explain to them that the Mexican walking fish isn't really a fish, it's kind of a salamander, and it's endangered in the wild. It only lives in a specific habitat in Mexico that's almost gone, but they are commonly kept as pets and in laboratories where their magical restorative properties are studied. Yes, we could do a whole episode on them, but unless they murder someone, it's probably a little too off-topic. Well, they don't actually murder, but they do defeat the slugs. Yeah, that's right. Evil slugs must go. Fancy slugs are fine. It's kind <laughs> of my life motto, so... Don't have Wi-Fi? It's okay. You don't need it to play. Don't have any kids? It's all right. Neither do we, and we play it all the time. <laughs> Engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of cute characters. Trust us, with over 100 million downloads, this 5-star rated mobile puzzle game is a must-play. Download Best Fiends free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Nice. So, where were we? All right, Theresia had just placed her husband's body somewhere in the Ziegelhofengasse and slipped away through the night. But it didn't take long until Matthias Candle was found and the police was called because there was an untrusted man with a mashed-in head. Uh, smashed in, right? Yeah, smashed. Well, I mean, <laughs> uh, it just depends on what kind of visual you're going for. They both are correct. <laughs> both are terrible. You would definitely call the police when you find one of those. For sure. Yeah. Soon the identity of the victim was cleared up. Matthias Candle, shop owner, living in Hungelbrunn 9. At first, everyone thought Matthias Kandel had been the victim of a robbery, because why else would he be out in the streets without clothes on? So they surely had been taken away from him, and without any belongings. Oh, right, because these were the days, like Robin Hood times, when people would just actually steal all your clothes. Yep. <laughs> yep. Could happen. You do forget, though, that that was a thing. Mm -hmm. You know, like, yeah. Uh, Good old days. The good, you know, the good old days when they'd <laughs> kill you for your boots. It still happens. It happens all the time, honestly. Well, it's, if it's I'm, a brand, right? Like, right, yeah. Or a, Adidas. Yeah, I like Adidas. Or how many times <laughs> have we seen somebody, it's awful, just somebody who's shot for a necklace. You know, just the stu mm -hmm. stupidest, the entirety of the Batman universe, right? It's true, yeah. Yep. So soon a witness came forward by the name of Josef Werner, and he was a baker who had a business relationship with Matthias, and he had heard the shop owner frequently complain about his young wife. And the baker was sure no one else but Theresia had killed Matthias Kandel. So the police rushed to investigate the most likely crime scene, the Kandel home at Hungelgrund 9. But at first glance there wasn't much to find and too many people had already been through the apartment. But then they looked in the bedroom and they found blood splatter on the walls that someone had been trying to wipe off. It's very mm. suspicious. 
Then they also found bloody clothes and later on the murder weapon. So they took Theresa to the police station where they started to question her. And finally, after quite some interrogations, she spoke the famous Auskoiden Hobbies Nimmer. I just couldn't take it anymore. And she tells the police everything. But they couldn't believe that she did all this by herself, so they kept asking her who had helped her. And of course they had heard about the affair with Michael Pellmann and of the illegitimate child, so they accused her of having murdered Matthias Kandl with her lover, the butcher's boy. And when Theresia heard the name Michael Pellmann and the mention of her child, the woman who was very soft-spoken and composed before completely lost it. She started to curse and yell, and in the end she had to be removed from the room by force and brought back to her prison cell. Bingo! The policeman thought. Indeed it must have been Pellmann who had helped her to kill her husband. So they started to look for him. There was just one minor problem. Michael Pellmann had joined the army and a new war against Napoleon was approaching. So Pellmann was not in Vienna that fateful December night. He was off in some garrison doing military training. So he couldn't have done it? Looks like it. Even though Theresia then incriminated him during the interrogations. So the police kept questioning Theresia, but she never caved, sticking with her testimony that, in the end, she had no help. Oh, maybe she didn't. This poor woman, what she was put through, do you think she had any help? Well, it's possible that she didn't. At first, I was sure about it, that she had help. Yeah. That was back when I thought that she did carry the heavy body for much further. The police came up with an idea how they could test Theresia's body strength. They filled a butte with bricks to simulate the weight of Matthias. And then they got Theresia to lift the butte on her shoulders and carry it around with some trick question. And so she did. It might be yet another lore, but it is what can be found in an interview with the director of the Kriminalmuseum in Vienna. So it could be true. I mean, he's an expert. Yeah, that seems like a solid source to me. Yeah. And if she really could carry the heavy butte around for a little bit, she could have carried it for one or two kilometers. So my guess is she actually did it alone. Yeah. In my opinion, the crime was not premeditated. I mean, she might have fantasized about killing her husband many times before. Mm -hmm. But that she did it that night, and the way she did it, she snapped. Yeah, understandable. If you look at it just from the perspective of she was an abused wife, never mind the fact that she had had a child that was taken from her, you know, she had been put through hell before she even met this guy, so... Yeah. You just, yeah, you can only take so much, really. It's awful. Theresa Kandl was found guilty on 3rd of March 1809 of killing her husband and was sentenced to death by hanging. An unusual verdict, making Theresa Kandl the first woman in Vienna to be executed. But before that, she had to endure the pillory. Oh, like it's not enough to kill someone. We have to humiliate mm. them first. Yeah. On 13th of March, 1809, she was displayed on the pillory at the Hohe Markt, right in the inner city. And because she was the first woman in the city to be sentenced to death, it was a spectacle. It looked as if the whole city was making its way to the place to look at her, spit at her, throw stuff, yell profanities. Just gonna love mob entertainment. <laughs> to be fair. If I would have lived in Vienna in 1809 and would have heard of this, maybe I would have been one of the looky loose too. I don't like to act as if I would have known any better back then. Oh yeah, no, I don't think we're any better than anybody. I think we try to stay as judgment-free mm. as we can be. You know, anytime there's a situation where we don't have all the facts and we've never lived that particular experience. I don't think I'd have ever attended an execution, but I look at crime scene photos. So yeah, I mean, and that's our modern selves. This is it. Yeah. Well, and also there's always that, oh, it's not even schadenfreude really, but just that just the knowledge that someone has it worse than you can make you feel mm -hmm. better during dark times. I mean, we still do that nowadays. We still have the virtual pillory. Yep, absolutely. All the time. All the time. So the execution took place only three days later. On 16th of March, 1809, they really didn't take a lot of time back then. No, they moved right along. And if you think that the pillory was a spectacle... You can't even imagine what execution day was like. It was crazy. People of Vienna had organized what can only be described as a huge carnival of fair. There were things like gallows beer and poor sinner sausage. People celebrated and got drunk. A woman about to be hung? Yeah, let's party! Well, now that does seem both inappropriate and over the top. <laughs> you think so? <laughs> No, listen, the bottom line is if there are people going to be there, then there are people there to sell stuff. Anytime the public gathers anywhere, 
There's people there to sell stuff, right? That's yep. capitalism 101, baby. <laughs> Rumor has it that Theresia did her part in entertaining the crowd when she was driven through the streets in what was called the Malefizwagen, so the horse-drawn carriage with wooden or iron bars. We all know that from movies, from witch trials. Sure. She yelled things like, Oh, I think I just lost my shoe, and Jesus, have you seen my bonnet? I must have misplaced it. And the crowd roared with laughter. I know, people were easily entertained back then in pre-Netflix days. Wow. So, there were more than 300 soldiers on duty that day to try and keep things run smoothly. Oof. And here comes another lore. It is said that Michael Pellmann was among those soldiers that day and that Theresa Kandl somehow knew that he was there. So when she was brought to the Spinnerin am Kreuz... The, um, sorry, what? Spinnerin am Kreuz. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think I need to explain really quickly. Please. The Spinnerin am Kreuz is a gothic pillar that is located nowadays in the 10th district at the Trieste Straße. So if that is the way you choose to drive into the city coming from the south, you will see it. And this pillar used to mark the border of the Viennese juridical district. And here, you might have guessed it, the public executions took place up until 1868, when Georg Ratkai was the last person in Vienna to be publicly executed. Fun fact! Or not so fun, however you want to see it. In the 1920s, there was a huge apartment building construction site going on in very close proximity to the Spinnerin am Kreuz. And they found countless skeletons buried there. Because, of course, the bodies of the executed people were mostly just thrown into a hole in the ground right then and there. Oh, so those apartments might actually be in a beautiful 1920s Art Deco style. And then also they're going to be super haunted. Yeah, they're not beautiful. They're not? Oh. So just like concrete block. But they might be haunted, yeah. They could be haunted. Ugly and haunted is more sad, though. <laughs> it's true. Oh, I would put up with a poltergeist, you know, if oh. I had a really pretty, like, high ceiling to 1920s Art Deco building to live in. But if it's, if it's just a block and then you've also got a poltergeist, that feels unfair. Yeah. Anyway. That sucks. <laughs> Bummer. What does the uh, Spinnerin um, cruise mean? S cruise? Okay, let me tell you a little story from my childhood. So okay. the German word for, sorry for the trigger, spider is Spinne. But Spinne is female. And in dialect, you can also say Spinnerin to a Spinne. And a Kreuz is a cross. So whenever I heard the term Spinnerin am Kreuz, which would happen more often than you would think, as it was often used to give directions. Oh, okay. So like take a left at the Spinnerin. Exactly. And of course, I used to think that there was a huge spider sitting on a cross and that you have to drive past the terrifying sight when going to Vienna. Yeah, I would believe that as well. But spinnen also means to spin wool. So a uh, spinnerin is a woman who spins wool. And legend has it that a woman was sitting on the hill right outside of Vienna under a huge wooden cross, every day spinning wool, while she was waiting for her husband to return, who had gone on one of the crusades. And that's how the spinnerin am Kreuz came to be. Well, the more you know. Yeah, that's, yeah. It's interesting, Probably though. never gonna need this knowledge, but there you go. You never know. Uh, I would like to know one thing, though. Where was I? <laughs> oh, uh, Theresia Candle was brought to the execution place, the gallows at the Spinnerin M. Cruz. 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 Spinner. Kreutz. Kreutz. The, yep, Spinnerin M. Kreutz. <laughs> right, thank you. She had heard that Michael Pellmann was one of the soldiers there, and so when she stepped off the carriage and made her way up the gallows, she kept looking around, trying to find his face. She wanted to die while looking at at least a familiar face in a crowd of angry and yelling and spitting faces. Oh. But this one really just seems to be lore, and it's most likely that Theresa Kandl died alone that day. While being surrounded by masses, it is said that 40,000 people attended the execution. Oof. According to the law, she was left hanging there until dusk, and then she was buried in a place that was reserved for people who had committed suicide. Oh, so not in a consecrated church cemetery? Yeah, that's what it means. Yeah. But Theresia didn't find peace in eternity, because soon after her body was stolen, dug up by body snatchers, and sold to a doctor who preserved her skeleton. Unbelievable, but true, the skeleton stayed in the doctor's family until 1924. 
Then it was handed over to the Criminal Museum and there it remains till this day together with the ex Theresia used to murder her husband. Oh, there's so much in that one paragraph that you just told me. Because can you imagine, first of all, keeping a skeleton like in your family home? Mm -hmm. For that long. I mean, we talk about skeletons in the closet, but these people literally had skeletons in the closet. And then uh, this museum sounds amazing. I really want to go to this museum. Yeah, it's on the list. Yeah. One other thing we can visit. Soon after the execution, people of Atzkasdorf, so the little village where Theresa was born, they decided to build her a little chapel to remember her by. Oh, Okay, so they didn't allow her to be buried in consecrated ground, but they did build the chapel for her? Yeah, Vienna. What What can I say? <laughs> I, it's, yeah, I get it. It's, yeah. So it can be found on the Breitenfurter Straße in Atzkersdorf, which is, as I said before, nowadays part of the 23rd district. Guess what? I walked past there several times already, and up until the research for this episode, I had no idea that this chapel was to remember the pretty but murderous... Theresia Kandel, the ex-murderer of Vienna. Just to tell this story completely, I want to add that there were, of course, people who thought that Matthias Kandel, even if he was not the most tender husband, was not actually aggressive or violent towards his young wife and that Theresia had only killed him to be free for Pellmann. It's, I mean, it's possible. It's possible, exactly. What do you think, Annie? I guess we feel the same way about this case. Of course... There is never an excuse for murder, but if Matthias Kandel was really a wild and a cruel man, she might have seen really no other way out, especially at the time back then. Yeah, no, I agree, especially during that time. And, you know, Vienna would have been Catholic, so no divorce, so it's not like she'd have had a way out of it, right? And mm -hmm. I'm guessing that even abuse wasn't grounds for annulment at that time. So she was just stuck. She was stuck. If if he was abusive, she was trapped, right? And if he was as violent with her as we think he might have been, then it was probably only a matter of time until he killed her. These things only escalate. They never get better, right? So I don't know. I'm guessing she might have felt like if she didn't do this, he'd have killed her, and at least she made sure that he couldn't hurt anyone else. I mean, I'm not saying that I condone murder at all. I would just say that I can understand why a person in this situation might feel like they had no choice or might be pushed past a breaking point. Yeah, agreed, yeah. Yeah, and oh, we've got numbers for people, don't we? So if you're listening to this and you're in the United States, the National Domestic Abuse Hotline is 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 7233. And RAIN, which is the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, their number is 1-800-656-HOPE. And you'll find these numbers. And you have do you have the ones for Europe? Well, for Europe, you can find a link to a directory for all helplines and organizations that support victims of domestic violence for all different countries in our links, pinned in our group, and I will also put it in the sources here. I have to add that in Austria, the only link is for the Women's Helpline Against Violence, but I would also like to add the link to Mena.at, where men who are victims of any form of violence, including domestic, can find help. We know that studies say that almost 40% of the victims of the domestic violence are men, and I personally wish this topic would finally find its recognition as well, and people would start talking about it more. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But this was the story of Theresia Kandel. No, that was a really fascinating one. That was... I enjoyed that. I didn't know that story at all. Now for or something good, do you want to go first? Yeah, I'll go first. You give you let you drink some water and rest your throat. <laughs> <laughs> I love it when you tell me a story. It's so relaxing. Today was a very exciting week for wildlife. So it looks like all the baby bunnies in our yard have... So baby rabbits, if you don't know, if you live in a city or in a place where you don't get them, it's pretty funny the way they build their nests because they're generally really right out in the open. They don't make a great attempt to hide rabbit nests. They're just sort of there. And so you have to be really careful. And my husband always is very careful because he's almost mowed them over with the lawnmower a few times. So now he's extra careful. But we had some baby bunnies and they've all grown up and moved underneath the back deck because they've chewed through the lattice work. We were also really excited to see a groundhog in the yard for the first time in years. When we moved in, there was this incredibly cool, very large custom playhouse in the garden uh, with working glass windows and Victorian gingerbread trim. It was amazing. 
building. But the best part for us was there was a groundhog living under it. Eventually, we realized that the playhouse was not getting the love it should. Uh, we thought that the dog might love it as a really fancy dog house because he was huge, but he never went near it unless he was trying to get the groundhog. He preferred the sort of high ground of the deck to survey his domain from. But we ended up finding a family that had, I think, Someone they knew had a tow truck business. Anyway, they came with a flatbed tow truck and like a crane and were able to take it away. And so now that thing is being loved by three kids and it all worked out well. But the groundhog disappeared not long after. And so that was maybe mm, four years ago. So I think this is our first groundhog in like four years. And I'm more excited than I should be about a groundhog. And then we also had one single lady turkey in the yard yesterday, which again, we haven't seen turkeys since we moved in. When we looked at the house, there were tons tons of turkey tracks, but we never actually had any turkeys, we think, because of Tucker. But my parents' place on the Cape is lousy with turkeys. So yeah, bunnies, groundhogs, and turkeys, oh my. It's just been, um, (laughs) that's been the highlight of my week. (laughs) My something good today is literally something that just happened today, this morning. So my something good is my good boy, Jam. No. We are making the move to the countryside at the moment, and here it's not possible to have him run off leash. In Vienna, we have our doggy woods where he ran off leash all the time. So my mom took me to a huge private fencing area today for Jem and Lila to run around. And they did, and they loved it. But then all of a sudden, I saw Jem running in the bushes (laughs) outside of the fence. And he was gone. Oh, it's the worst. (sighs) So I went after him, but had to go from the other side as it was where the gate was. So I race around the huge lot and yell, but he's nowhere to be seen. I yell and I yell and it's all fields there with bunnies and pheasants and deer. And I feel panic creeping up and I feel tears building up. And all of a sudden, I see only the white tip of the tail peeking out of the knee-high grass all (laughs) the other way on the opposite end of the field. In case you don't know, the, the white tip is essential for purebred beagles because... That's what makes him visible while they are following the trails for the hunter. And it's genius, really. (laughs) I'm actually in beagle groups in Facebook, and we always play Where's the Beagle with photos to see who can (laughs) spot the beagle first. So my eyes are very well trained. (laughs) So I see the tail, and I yell, and I clap my hands. But Jem is busy following some bunny scent. So I try to change my voice from anxious to happy with kind of suppressed anger. And I squeak, (laughs) Jem, Jem, where's my boy? And he finally (laughs) turns around and he runs towards me, his ears flapping. Oh. So that was my morning. (laughs) I'm just so glad it had a happy ending because my biggest fear, you know, was that he either was run over or shot by a hunter. Oh, yeah. If you ask, how did he get out? He (laughs) immediately found the one and only tiniest hole in the fence and he squeezed through. Of course he did. Oh, Mm -hmm. we had, when we first fenced in our yard, it's like at the front, there's a lot of six foot chain link, but it's a little over an acre. So then it switches when it goes to the woods, it switches to four foot chain link instead of six foot privacy, like wood. And we didn't think we had to put guide wires around the bottom because when we had Tucker, I mean, we'd had him at that point for three years and he wouldn't nudge a door open with his nose. Uh, if the vacuum was out, he wouldn't step across the cord of the vacuum. Like he just wouldn't do anything. And sure enough, I'm out there. I don't see him for a minute. I go to look and he had just pushed himself right under the fence because it just flipped right up. And he was in the neighbor's yard (laughs) trying to find their dogs. And I was like, oh, no. And then again, had to run around the other side. And it's like, Tucker. And he only did it to me. He never did it when Paul was home. And so then we had to the fence guys come in and restake the bottom so he wouldn't just sneak out. Yeah, he'd get mad sometimes when Paul wouldn't take him to work. He liked going to work with Paul. And if uh, Paul was in the field or whatever, he'd sometimes pout and like try to pack his little bag and run away. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Thanks so much for listening, everyone. I hope you all enjoyed this story as much as I did. I always love these uh, lesser known stories from Austria and Germany and Europe in general that just never heard of. If you have the tiniest bit of spare time and could leave us a review, we'd very much appreciate it. It's How Strangers Find Us. 
Yes, and please tell your friends about us. Uh, also, you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Come join our Facebook group. It's a really fun, weird group of people. And just my favorite place on Facebook these days. There's no drama, no politics. There's a pin post for virus stuff, so even that's tucked away. Just really interesting people from all over the world. It's an absolute delight. Also, please tell your dogs and all the other pets, all the wallabies, all the cats, all the, uh, what do we have? Lizards. Guinea pigs. Tell Guinea them pigs. we said hi. Yep. Tell them all. We love them very much. And please remember that if you're going through hell, keep going. Tschüss. Bye. Bye.